an introduction to money. Money in the faith people place in it is central to the workings of the modern economy. However, money comes in many different forms. And as it has evolved over time, the definition of money has changed with it. In order to understand what exactly money is in a modern economy, it's helpful to break down money into its differing roles. Firstly, as a store of value. Secondly, a unit of account. Thirdly, a medium of exchange. Firstly, let's look at money as a store of value. So money is used as a store of value just like precious metals were in the past. Gold and other precious metals have intrinsic value, and that intrinsic value does not tend to change unpredictably over time. Now compare this with food, for example, which does have an intrinsic value, but since food decays, food was not considered a good store of value. Therefore, uh, it is not surprising that precious metals in the form of coins became one of the earliest forms of money as a store of value. And today, we use money as a store of value not because it has intrinsic value, but because of the faith we and others place in its value as a unit of account or a medium of exchange. Now, let's look at money as a unit of account. Money, when it's working properly, provides a consistent measure for comparing the value or cost of a range of goods and services. In a modern economy, this form is usually a currency, such as pounds, dollars, or euros. And we also use these currencies as a unit of account to record debts and loans. Lastly, money is a medium of exchange. People hold money because they plan to swap it for something else at a later date. Modern money has no intrinsic utility. People don't collect coins and notes to be used for any purpose other than to exchange them for goods or services at some point in the future. In a modern economy, this medium of exchange takes form in currency or money. Now, all three of these functions are closely linked and are, to a large extent, interdependent. A currency which is accepted as a unit of account a medium of exchange, but whose reliability as a store of value is questionable, is ultimately likely to fail in its utility to a modern economy. And this is exactly what happened in post-World War I Germany, where hyperinflation had a huge impact on the stability of society. Types of money in a modern economy. Before considering the different ways money circulates in an economy, we need to first divide the principal actors into three main groupings. There are central banks, such as the Bank of England, and commercial banks, and consumers. So having established these, we can consider the different types of money that occur in the economy. First of all, there are notes and coins, and these are IOUs from central banks to consumers and commercial banks, which are recorded physically. Second, we've got bank deposits. Now, these are IOUs from commercial banks to consumers, usually, and they're recorded electronically. Then three, central bank reserves, and these are IOUs from the central banks to the commercial banks, which are also recorded electronically. So let's take a look at these in a little more detail. Notes and coins, or cash, represent nothing more than promises to pay the holder from the relevant central bank. And these are recorded as a liability of the central bank, an asset of consumers and commercial banks who hold it. So when the Bank of England was founded in 1694, the first banknotes were, however, directly convertible for gold. And while observing the gold standard, the Bank of England always had sufficient gold available to match the number of notes and coins in circulation, and the promise to pay the bearer of banknotes was backed up by the physical gold held in the Bank of England's vaults. Except for a few short periods, 
This is how the bank operated for the following 250 years. Since 1931, however, the Bank of England's money in circulation has been fiat money. Paper money that is not convertible to gold or any other asset. Therefore, the holder of a modern banknote can no longer exchange their notes for gold at the Bank of England. All he can do is swap it for other similar notes and coins. We call this fiat money, and fiat money derives its value, therefore, not from direct convertibility, rather from being a trusted medium of exchange used by consumers, commercial banks, and governments, which is deemed to be reliably convertible for goods and services. Next, let's look at bank deposits. Now, bank deposits make up most of the money in a modern economy. For security and convenience, consumers prefer the ease of access and safety of storing larger amounts of money with commercial banks. And as a reward for doing so, commercial banks will offer an interest rate on this money. Another benefit in contrast to paper money. Bank deposits come in a range of different forms and are recorded in electronic ledgers. So one could say that most money really is just numbers on a screen. So when you deposit paper money at a bank, you're simply swapping an IOU from the central bank for an IOU from the commercial bank. In fact, when you deposit cash at a commercial bank, that commercial bank now has a new asset, the paper IOU from the central bank, and a new liability, which is your deposit. Bank deposits are now the most widely used store of value and medium of exchange. You've likely bought something recently using your credit card, for example. No, pipe, no paper money was exchanged. Rather, you transferred some of your bank deposit to a third party in exchange for a good or service. It is important to note that bank deposits are created by commercial banks, just like fiat money is created by central banks. And we will cover off the dynamics of this in more detail in a moment. So lastly, let us look at central bank reserves. And these are electronic rather than physical IOUs from central banks to commercial banks who, either through choice or as a result of regulation, place money with the central bank. These reserves are simply an electronic record of the amount owed by the central bank to each individual commercial bank and can be used to transfer value between commercial banks, but not from or to consumers. So while these are the typical ways money can be thought of, central bankers and economists like to think of it in a slightly different way, a different way of categorizing money. And this is to divide money into two categories. And these are base money and broad money. So what is broad money? Broad money is the amount of money that consumers have available for transactions and is made up of Banknotes and coins, these are the IOUs from the central bank, and bank deposits, which are the IOUs from commercial banks. The second category, the base money, often referred to as central bank money. And this is made up of currency issued by central banks, again it's those banknotes and coins, as well as central bank reserves, which is money in the form of IOUs from central banks to the commercial banks. how banks create money by making loans. The vast majority of money takes the form of deposits that individuals and businesses have left with commercial banks, rather than the paper money issued by central banks. However, where these banks' deposits come from is often misunderstood. A common belief is that banks simply act as intermediaries. They accept deposits from society's savers and they lend the same money to society's borrowers. This would mean that bank deposits are created by the decision of consumers to save, with banks then lending out these savings or deposits to borrowers. This is a useful shorthand way to think about how banks operate and how a bank's balance sheet is comprised, or to better understand commercial banks' role in maturity transformation, for example. But it's not true. The actual relationship is the inverse of that usually assumed. 
commercial banks decide how much they can profitably lend in the market. And then that lending activity creates new bank deposits. We can understand this better by thinking of a real world example. Now, imagine that you went today to your own bank and you took out a two year personal loan for £1,000. Assuming the bank is happy with your credit rating and assuming that you and your bank can agree on an appropriate interest rate, then the deal will be struck and the loan will be concluded in short order. Two things will now follow. And these follow simultaneously. Firstly, the bank will record a loan of £1,000 that you owe and the bank will then credit your current account with £1,000. At that precise moment, new money has been created. Now let's look at this transaction from the perspective of the bank's balance sheet. Here's the bank's balance sheet the moment before you walked into the branch. Now at the agreement of the loan, the bank's asset base increases by 1,000 in recognition of the financial asset that has been created. This is the 1,000 you have agreed to repay at the end of the two-year time. And secondly, in the act of crediting your current account, the bank has also created a corresponding liability of 1,000. The bank's balance sheet has therefore grown on each side by £1,000, and the supply of money in society has increased by that £1,000. So to re-express this more technically, we can say that new broad money has been created in the form of bank deposits without there being any change in the amount of base money in the economy, because no new paper money has been printed, and nor have any extra central bank reserves been created. In reverse, paying off a bank loan, a mortgage or credit card, actually destroys money. When the time comes for you to repay the £1,000 loan, then the money you transfer to the bank is written off against the asset the bank previously held. Now, another common belief is that central banks determine the quantity of loans and deposits in the economy by controlling the amount of base money, i.e. central bank reserves and banknotes. But as you can see from our example, this is not true, at least in an open economy. Limits on the banking system's ability to create money. Although banks are responsible for the creation of money through their lending behaviour, they cannot in practice do this without limit. A number of factors impact the level of new lending and money creation. Central bank monetary policy, market forces, capital requirements, behaviour of consumers. Firstly and arguably, most importantly, is central bank monetary policy. By influencing the level of interest rates in the economy, the central bank affects how much consumers can afford and wish to borrow. This can occur directly by influencing loan and mortgage rates, but also indirectly by impacting broader economic activity because most central banks have a monopoly on providing central bank reserves, the price which they pay on these reserves has an impact on interest rates in the broader economy. Most central banks have a mandate to control inflation. So if we consider inflation is what happens when too much money is chasing too few goods, then you can see that by raising policy rates, central banks reduce the propensity for commercial banks and consumers to create new money by increasing the cost of that new money. Or, put it another way, by reducing the affordability of new money. And that is why the central bank policy rate is such an important economic tool. Now, secondly, and closely linked to the first point, there is a finite pool of creditworthy consumers to lend to for any given level of interest rates. So when this pool is depleted, the risk-reward payoff no longer stands and lending becomes unprofitable, and money supply will slow. If banks think policy rates will rise and affordability will decline, then their propensity to create new money will fall. Prudential regulation also limits the capacity of banks to make loans and create money. 
All commercial banks are required to hold capital reserves to protect depositors from the impact of losses that might arise from loans in their asset base. And for every new loan, the bank must reserve more capital. The capital required to support new lending might not always be available or available at a price the bank is willing to pay. Lastly is the behaviour of consumers who can destroy money by repaying debt or who can take out loans without increasing the money supply in the economy if they simply use the new loans to consolidate or repay other loans.